Um, but I also think it's very important for Nietzsche to then see that that morality severs its tie with a particular social class so that once slave morality triumphs, we find um, lots of middle and upper middle class folks like you and me subscribing to slave morality mm -hmm. as, as well. And we, sh we should say historically that Christianity played a very complicated role in American slavery. On the one hand, it probably did have the function to a certain extent of making people accommodate with suffering and not protest. But on the other hand, there was a definitely a, a cohesive uh, foundations of protest uh, movement that's owed to the church. Brian, I, I wanted to just briefly get back to the good question about what people should read, what editions. Now, I was brought up on Walter Kaufman's translations and the Modern Library uh, selection. Is that still a good place to start? Uh, Kaufman's translations are certainly a very good place to start. Um, Kaufman... Uh, Kaufman is gifted at capturing the flavor of Nietzsche's German in English. Um, scholars will sometimes complain that he takes liberties with some of the German, but I think for the general reader, Kaufman's uh, translation is the best place to start. More recently, Cambridge University Press has been publishing new translations, which are pretty uniformly of high quality. Oh, coming up soon, uh, we'll talk about some of Nietzsche's inspirations, in particular his uh, Arthur Schopenhauer, who I guess John and he need to share a love, both as teenagers. You both loved Schopenhauer, is that right? Yes, I, I, I gather that, that he loved uh, Schopenhauer as a teenager because some of his early writings say nice things about Schopenhauer. I like Schopenhauer because he's such a grouch. He hated uh, women, he hated men, he hated students, he hated professors. He was just grouchy about everything, and for some reason when I was a teenager that really fit my mood. Now, of course, I'm just kind of a happy-go-lucky, loves-everybody kind of guy. Yeah, right. But well, we're going to hear something about Schopenhauer, aren't we, Ken? Yeah, from me and Schultz, our 60-second philosophers. Uh, we'll be right back. Soul sensation, Jerry Butler and Only the Strong Survive. My partner, Ken Taylor, is kind of a soul sensation, a soul phenomenon in his own right. You got that, John. I'm John Perry, and this is Philosophy Talk, the program that questions everything. Except your intelligence. So I'm getting quite an earful here about Nietzsche, morality, Superman, and the like. Uh, let's dig a little bit deeper. Let's look at the background a little bit. Today, Ian Scholes, the 60-second philosopher, tells us about... Schopenhauer, who was a big influence on Nietzsche. Prepare yourself. Ready? Go! Ian Scholes, Immanuel Kant posited an unknowable reality behind our observed reality. Arthur Schopenhauer, born 1788, died 1860, claimed to know that unknowable reality. It is the will. The human will rules the intellect, tormenting us with our own desires. We do not live life for the pleasure of it, but because the will to live is irresistible, instinctive, and irrational. This philosophy appealed greatly to two of his later fans, Friedrich Nietzsche and Richard Wagner. Schopenhauer, as a young man, was apprenticed to German merchants, expected to take over his father's business. Then his father died, apparently a suicide in 1807, and the inheritance made it possible for Schopenhauer to pursue the life of the mind. He was the first Western philosopher to incorporate Eastern thought. His themes involved real life, not abstract philosophical puzzles, and unlike previous philosophies, Schopenhauer's revealed a deep pessimism. In Schopenhauer's time, unfortunately for him, readers preferred Hegel, his colleague at Heidelberg University. Schopenhauer hated Hegel, whether for his philosophy or his popularity is not clear. He did write, however, quote, If I were to say that the so-called philosophy of this fellow Hegel is a pseudo-philosophy, paralyzing all mental powers, stifling all real thinking, and by the most outrageous misuse of language, putting in its place the hollowest, most senseless, thoughtless, most stupefying verbiage, I should be quite right, unquote. Unlike many philosophers, Schopenhauer wrote in a direct manner, and was often quite funny, especially when he was being nasty. And he was a nasty man, vain, antisocial, curmudgeonly, and misogynist. Read his essay on women, if you dare. He considered five-sixths of all humanity worth only contempt. The story goes that he pushed an old woman down a flight of stairs because her chatting with a friend irritated him. She broke a leg, and he was forced to provide her pension for the remainder of her life. When she died, the story continues, he replied to the letter giving him the news, Obit unus abit. She dies, the burden departs. In later life, he found fame, but it did not dent his bitter self-regard. After a heart attack, he told a friend, quote, If at times I thought myself unfortunate, it is because of a confusion and error. I have mistaken myself for someone else. Who am I really? I am the author of the world as will and representation. I am the one who has given an answer to the mystery of being that will occupy the thinkers of future centuries. That is what I am, and who can dispute it in the years of life that still remain for me, unquote. He died soon after. Schopenhauer had a major influence not only on Nietzsche, but Wittgenstein, Jung, Freud, Einstein, Thomas Mann, and Adolf Hitler. I gotta go. 
Ian Scholes, the 60-second philosopher describing the life of Arthur Schopenhauer, a major influence on the man of the hour here on Philosophy Talk, Frederick Nietzsche. I'm John Perry. And I'm Ken Taylor. Our guest is Brian Leiter from the University of Texas at Austin. John, I've got to tell you, one of my favorite lines from Nietzsche is his refutation. In the end, you know, he, 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 he rejected Schopenhauer's pessimism. And here's how he, he does it. I, I, love, I love this line. He says, Schopenhauer was such a pessimist, but he played the flute. Every day after dinner, he stops before morality or something like that, but he played the flute. Now, how's that for a refut- refutation? I, I think it's just a wonderful refutation. Uh, you know, it's probably one of the most valid arguments Nietzsche ever came up with. Whoops, I better be careful. We've got yeah. Brian Leiter on the line. Yeah, he, so, yes, <laughs> indeed. Yeah. So, Brian, uh, I had a thought about this herd morality thing. Uh, you know, Nietzsche criticizes it, uh, but it seems to me you got these artistes around of themselves, these these superior noble people. If, I, if I'm one of the herd, I, I, I think herd morality is a darn good thing. How else am I to t- keep these folks in check? So, I mean, it's not, I mean, he's just, it seems to me he's just pointing out a fact and from the herd's perspective, a darn good fact about their morality. Uh, how do you speak? Well, my response is, in fact, I think that's exactly how Nietzsche looks at it, which is one of the reasons I said before I don't think he anticipates a general moral revolution in society. One of, his, one of the lines he uses, he says, herd morality for the herd, but let it not reach out beyond. Um, and if that, in fact, is his, uh, his attitude, the explanation might be exactly the one you gave. Yeah, so maybe the picture we get, I don't, tell me if I'm reading this right, maybe the picture we get is of, I mean, human life is going to be constant struggle. There'll be the herd, there'll be the, no, the, the nobles, as it were, and there, there, there's never going to be a kind of modus vivendi, a kind of shared life among them, it, but there's always this tension. I mean, I mean and that's life. That's, that's the way it is. I mean... Um- I think. I mean. I think to some extent that is uh, uh, is what Nietzsche's Nietzsche's picture uh, picture is. What he's really concerned about is he thinks that in a culture that took morality very seriously, um, we wouldn't have any of these sort of higher individuals, right? If we wouldn't have any of these Goethe's or these Nietzsche's or these or these Beethovens or pick your favorite example, everybody would be in the grips of the utilitarian, altruistic, selfless mindset. Um, uh, and there would be enormous cultural costs. And at the end of the day, Nietzsche likes high culture. Yeah, that that seems to be the case. Now, now, just hearing about Schopenhauer and being reminded of his uh, anti-women views, how, how did Nietzsche stack up on that? I don't remember him discussing too many women in his books. Did he have a anti-woman bias like Schopenhauer? Uh, it is often said, uh, and famous passages can be adduced here and there, that... Um, that Nietzsche is a misogynist. Um, it seems to me the reality of it is, is a bit more complex um, because it turns out that a great deal of what Nietzsche says about women involves exploiting certain 19th century stereotypes about women. For example, that they are instinctual rather than rational. Mm-hmm. But then if you think about Nietzsche, you realize that in fact he thinks that's the right valuation, that it's much better to be instinctual right. than to be essentially, uh, uh, excessively uh, prone to ratiocination about everything. So, so he exploits these stereotypes. It sounds like he's being derogatory, but it clearly, in, in many contexts, I don't want to say all in many contexts, it's, it's part of a subversive project. And in a way, he thinks the women have exactly the stereotypical traits of the women as 19th century Europeans would have thought about it are exactly the traits with the higher value. So, uh, Brian, so, uh, we're getting near the bottom of the show. I'm going to take one more caller here. Uh, Anna in San Francisco is on the line. Welcome to Philosophy Talk, Anna. Hi, John, Ken, and Brian. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I'm recommending a book called Thou Shalt Not Be Aware by a psychoanalyst or former psychoanalyst named Alice Miller, a German writer who looked into the life of Nietzsche. And I I know you're going to accuse me of the genetic fallacy, but I do think that a life can illuminate the philosophy that comes out of it. And Nietzsche was, in fact, throughout his life, pretty much under the control of his mother and his sister, Mm. to the extent that, as you know, uh, the will to power and his sisters pushing his thought into the uh, Nazi mold, uh, he did say some extraordinarily misogynistic things, including, you know, are you going to the women? Don't forget the whip. So you think he may but have he had himself? 
uh, context does had count. no free will <laughs> in freeing himself from the women in his life. Yeah, yeah th thanks. Yeah, uh, very uh, interesting, very interesting uh, uh, recommendation there.